Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Not Content Podcast. On this podcast, we pull from the seemingly endless queue of movies, television shows, and maybe even some other surprises along the way as part of our podcast channel from the queue. On this episode, Brian, what are, what are we talking about tonight? Godzilla! <laughs> Please subscribe, like, and review from the queue on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform, especially Spotify and Apple, as you get these algorithms going with positive feedback. You can also find our channel on Blue Sky at From the Queue, as well as uh, X. You can also find us through Instagram and threads at From the Queue. If you are listening to us on YouTube, all our links will be in the description below. And yes, please like and subscribe all of our videos, as well as our channel on YouTube. My name is Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Instagram at Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Blue Sky and on X for now at Jerome C1985. My co-host is Brian. Uh, you can find him on Twitter for now at Brian to Brain. Uh, Brian, do you have any updates on the YouTube channel as well as uh, our podcasting uh, platforms, Spotify, Apple? Give us an update. So we're on the uh... Spotify, Apple, I think I can get us on iHeartRadio as well. I'm trying to play with this RS feed. Uh, I've never done an RS or played with an RSS feed before, but, it, you know, based on what I've learned, I was able to upload our back catalog onto YouTube, and that's kind of it and going okay right now. I mean, for some reason, the the episode we did in 2020 about Enter the Dragon is kind of going, not viral, but it's picking up steam in the last two days for some reason as of this recording. So check that out, I guess, because it's being recommended a lot on a lot of those YouTube recommendations. So we're getting out there. So uh, people are definitely checking that episode out, but uh, check out a whole back catalog. I'm going to slowly update it. I know there's some like copyright things going on, but that's probably just, you know, they're going to mute some stuff out, but it's only in certain countries. But uh, yeah, it's coming together and we have a nice backlog now on YouTube. So we actually have a channel built like overnight. So it was kind of cool that we were able to connect the RSS feed to the YouTube channel. So all that's kind of connected now. So we're growing still slowly, but uh, it's fun because we get to connect the old episodes now to a newer audience, and it seems like a newer audience is finding our new or older episodes, so that's kind of cool. So we're slowly getting there. All right, Brian, this is another suggestion of yours, and of course, I, I'm going along with it because I am very interested in the topic. Uh, we talked about Godzilla last year. Uh, we did a run on our previous podcast, Pantheon Plus. Uh, we talked about the 2016 release, Shin Godzilla, and I am extremely happy, extremely pleased to be talking about Godzilla Minus One today, as well as Monarch, the Apple TV series, uh, featuring many of the titans that have become such a popular part of uh, our culture in the last few years with uh, some of the movies. But first of all, let's talk about, let's discuss... Uh, Godzilla Minus One, and I think this is a movie that very much uh, kind of stole the month of December. You know, I'm not going to say it was a huge hit, but just to, when you look at its box office and when you compare it to its budget, which may or may not be $15 million, uh, the director of the film has said it was even less than that. But uh, what they were able to do, what Takashi Yamazaki was able to do with uh, Godzilla Minus One uh, was incredibly impressive. It did not look and feel like $15 million. It really did feel like something uh, so much more than that, and I was just incredibly impressed uh, by the performances. Ryanowski, Kamiki, uh, was tremendous in his role, kind of in the lead, uh, playing a kamikaze pilot, and uh, just the cast all around did a great job. You really felt the emotions, and I think this is the the best Godzilla movie in terms of actually getting you to invest in the people as opposed to just sitting around and waiting for Godzilla to destroy a city. And believe me, this movie does have that. But I think what makes this movie stand out so much more from previous Godzilla movies, whether they're good, bad, or somewhere in between, is that level of investment. And I know that's something that you really liked as well. I couldn't believe it. 
You know what I mean? Like, we've always been talking about human stories and Godzilla kaiju movies never working well. Uh, some would argue that it kind of worked in King Kong versus Godzilla somewhat a little bit because you kind of got invested in some of those characters. But in this case, it's like the story is about them and like the characters. Godzilla's kind of this side piece that kind of is like the antagonist of it all. Usually when we see these Godzilla movies in the modern era, Godzilla's kind of the uh, protagonist, so to speak. He's kind of the hero. In this case, he is straight up a villain and they treat him like, you know, the shark from Jaws, which they should, I think, because... If you watch Jaws, obviously, and they took a lot from Jaws, he has no rhyme or reason. He's just out there eating people, and it's like there's no motive. He's just out there. He's an eating machine. And in this case, Godzilla is a killing machine, and he just goes out on a rampage, angry from the start. So you can feel that emotion, like this vengeance kind of plot as well. as like he, as soon as Godzilla attacks the city, um, Koichi just wants revenge, man. And he's so he's, you see that scream in the trailer, and it's so much raw emotion coming out of the guy. And uh, his performance was just so incredibly sad. Like, I I did not expect the kind of story that, you know, going in like a kamikaze pilot, not wanting to be a kamikaze pilot anymore, kind of rejecting that role. And then the whole notion about Japan not, you know, supporting its soldiers during the war and like, you know, using their soldiers as like sacrificial lambs, that kind of thing. And then the whole idea is like the people are just tired of it. They want change. They don't want their people to be used like that anymore. And there's a lot of great speeches in this film. A lot of speeches that kind of, you know, brings people together, like the community together to fight for a common goal kind of gimmick. And it works really well. And there's some great scenes with that. And it kind of reminds you of like a little bit of New Hope when it comes to those scenes. But still, like, I think, you know, we, we talk about movies borrowing from other movies and not executing well. In this case, the first act was Jurassic Park. The second act was Jaws. The third act was A New Hope. And it just fucking clicked. And uh, there was so many great moments that I was just like, I wanted to stand up in the theater and clap. And there's a great di- there's great dialogue moments throughout the film, layered, and it's just kind of like these subtle messages about war and like anti-war messages and that kind of thing. And I think probably the best line of the whole movie is from that boat captain talking to the kid, and he's all like, "You should be proud that you were never involved in a war. That's something to be proud of." And I was like, "God damn, that's one of the most profound things I've ever heard in my life." Just something simple like that. So they really executed this film well, and uh, yeah, the special effects were were great and it was minimalized too because Godzilla is not all over the movie but he comes out at specific points right when you you know right to, to elevate the tension and uh I don't know how but the CGI looked really really great maybe they just kind of minimalized things and kind of I don't know what they did but they made it seem like he was this giant thing and he killed 30,000 people and they actually say 30,000 people this time so they actually give you a real number and it just puts things into perspective about how uh, a kaiju can come in and just destroy everything and the actual like repercussions of it we kind of saw that in Shin Godzilla but in this case I feel like they really showed you the human side of a kaiju coming in and causing all this like PTSD for people and I think what makes this movie very unique is when you think about Godzilla as a character they very much brought up this idea of this is actually taking place during World War II whereas in the past I think Godzilla has been a byproduct of the radiation and Godzilla has very much served to be a, a commentary on uh, a post-nuclear world in a lot of ways. And I think this movie uh, takes us back a little bit. Uh, one of the funniest things I heard was that this is actually an Oppenheimer prequel. And that that made me laugh pretty hard. Uh, that this movie would naturally... Every Godzilla uh, movie. Lead. Or the original movie is a prequel. And yeah, every Godzilla movie is a sequel to Oppenheimer pretty much. So... Uh, and I, I was just, I was very impressed by this movie in a way that I think so many, so many of the other blockbusters that have come out and, you know, I don't want to, I don't, I think we bury, we, we bury Marvel enough in, in society. So what I want to bring up is I want to bring up uh, another big time uh, franchise, which is Fast and the Furious. And, you know, last year, the, the 10th Fast and the Furious movie came out and it was just so overstuffed with characters it was two and a half hours long and you just did not get any time to invest in anything that was happening on screen it just felt like there were actors not in the same room with each other even when they're talking to each other and i compare that to something like this which again doesn't really have the budget and i don't think it's a perfect looking movie at times 
but I think you really feel the heart. I think you feel the characters so much more. And I think, again, this is also a movie that is right around the two-hour mark. I think it's just under two hours. And the fact that they are able to, to, to tell this very focused story, kind of about this one area, village, eventually branching out, become kind of a full-fledged city. You know, I really like that progress that we see in the love story that develops. I mean, this is a love story uh, that you can also get involved with and become invested in. That's also something that we don't probably see enough in movies these days. Uh, it, it was it predictable that when she gets blown away, like, I don't know about you, but as soon as she got blown away and they assumed she was dead, I was like, she's going to come back at the end. And, and she does. And, I mean, I don't necessarily think of that as a bad thing. But it's it's very clear that this movie was going for something different beyond just Godzilla smash things use fire breath. I think in a lot of ways, I mean, it's it's not exactly the same kind of format as Shin Godzilla, but I think it does have a lot of very similar beats in the way that they use Godzilla in terms of the coming together in the second part, uh, in terms of like at the end, the way that Godzilla is defeated so even though it is not similar to Shin Godzilla in terms of the time and in terms of like like the first half of Shin Godzilla is almost a parody of something like the West Wing or you know these poli- covering the political bureaucracy of destroying a monster and this movie is very much about you know people coming together when there is no like centralized government because you know the United States is basically running Japan for a little while there so I think it really, this movie really allows us to breathe uh, with these characters. And I think that's also something that's very much appreciated. I think the the score is also really great. And when they bring in the big Godzilla theme, like, it just, it feels very classical in the way that it's used. And in, even the way that it sounds, it feels very much like they're not, they're not putting like a new age spin on this, like a, not a not modern spin. But this feels like something that you would hear in the 1950s version of Godzilla, or if this movie was made in 1944, 45, 46. This is the this is what you would hear for Godzilla's theme, and I think that's really effective. What I like too is like the little details with like the radio. I don't know if you noticed, but the radio sounded like it was from 1945. Which is really cool because nowadays I think they would kind of just record it normally and digitize it, but it felt like they really recorded it on some like analog like record player uh, when they when they're playing that stuff on the radio. So they really went to their like lengths to authenticate a lot of the visuals and the look of it all. And like apparently they went to like they went to some experts about what the actual fighter pilots or the the, the you know the pilot or the uh, planes they were using like totally authentic to try to make it like that because I guess certain carriers and certain like uh things were banned by the united states post world war ii so you know they couldn't have like armory on certain boats or something like that or something crazy like that so they try to get it as authentic as possible so that was really cool as well and uh just the look of this film is so like like totally vintage and it feels real and i like you know i like as much as i like the show echo it just feels at times that you could tell it's a green screen you know what I mean? But this doesn't feel like it's a green screen. It's like they put the green screen further in the distance of the of the frame of what you're seeing. And a lot of the foreground is like real sets and real people. And then when they go inside of the dude's house, it's like it's a small house. But then people are sitting down together and it becomes a more intimate setting. And so you get to know these characters a little more when they're inside the house. So I love those scenes when, you know, they're talking in the house and they have dinner over or whatever. And you get to, like, you have these little character moments, you know what I mean? You find out that they're not a couple and that the, everyone thinks that they're married and they're not, even though they have this kid that they adopted, so to speak. And that was really cool, too, this idea that all their parents or the main characters, the the you know, the love story, the two uh, young actors and the baby, they're all orphans. And I think that's that's a like a powerful message about, you know, families coming together post, you know, a war when the, everyone's lost their own family and them coming together to make their own family. And uh, they even make a commentary about it. Like one of his friends is like, that's beautiful, man. You know, and what a beautiful story. And it is a beautiful story. And it's like, how can they, wow, like they thought of this just for a Godzilla movie, just for you to be so emotionally invested in these characters that you're rooting for them. You know what I mean? And you're actually rooting for the characters as opposed to just kind of watching what happens to them. And like the classic Godzilla movies where you're just not really invested in the characters, you're more invested in the action and the plot line and, and Godzilla himself. But in this case, it's all about, 
oh man, this dude is like got PTSD. He didn't deserve what he got on that island at the beginning of the movie. We should kind of clear up too. At the beginning of the movie, he lands on this island, claiming he's got mechanical fair, failure, which he doesn't. He just doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to sacrifice his life, and that's totally a sane decision to do. You know, but in the in in that time, people thought he was like this traitor. You know what I mean? Even his neighbor is calling him a coward, and I'm just like, oh, dude, that is so, so fucked up. But that's the emotional gut punch they want you to feel. It's like you want to feel bad for they want you to feel bad for this guy for wanting to live, which is you know crazy to say out loud when you say it's something like that. But in you know World War II, like Japan was not. They were just thinking differently, man. They were using kamikaze pilots. They even mentioned the fact that, a, like, almost all their planes or, you know, fighter pilot planes had no ejector seats, which is nuts. Uh, and then they kind of made a commentary about that, which leads to the big moment at the end of putting an ejector seat in the, in the plane. So they set these things up really well, and they kind of reflect, like, these bad decisions that the Japanese government was making at the time. And they even show, like, the government did not warn the people when Godzilla was coming in the middle of the movie, man. They wanted to seem like they didn't know so they would have no one to blame or, like, take the blame. Because if they were the ones to say that there's the kaiju coming, it's going to be like, oh, how can, we, how can we do anything about it? You just let it happen? So they just didn't tell the people so they can get away without having, like, you know, getting the blame for it. So it was just so, like, wow. The Japanese government was really, like, getting criticized in this movie for, for that time period. But I think justifiably so because... Again, like the whole idea of a kamikaze pilot and today's, I mean, God, I, I don't know. It just seems so insane today to kind of say those things, but it was real. Yeah, I think that this is a this is a movie that is definitely trying to say something in terms of war and in terms of, you know, the commentary. And look, I think whenever these modern movies make political commentaries. I think there's, there is a critique of, Oh, these movies are woke. And it's like, if you call Godzilla woke, you have completely misunderstood this franchise. Godzilla has been used to make commentary about nuclear war literally since the very first movie. So I don't want to hear any of that. And I think the American movies, maybe not as much, but I think that with a movie like this, they're really underlining what the purpose of uh, Godzilla is. And I think in terms of the, the why this movie works, it's because uh, they allow you to invest in the characters. And the fact that it's not a modern setting, I think it helps um, because, you, you know, we're not focused on like the characters of now and how does this relate to the other movies? Like this is just a very well told story. Um, that I don't necessarily think you don't have to you don't have to know Godzilla lore to appreciate this. I mean, I, it doesn't help, yes, to an extent, but in my opinion, I think you can watch this movie without having never seen another Godzilla movie in your life and still really enjoy it. Yeah, totally. Because uh, I was picking up on some of the lore, and I would actually forgot some of it as well because there's that moment where. It's it's the it's the scene of the trailer where Godzilla's chasing him in the ocean. It looks like Jaws, right? Um, now what they don't show you in the trailer is that they actually blow up his head. They actually were able to do it, but you see it grow back. And when that happened, I was like, oh! and then I was like, oh yeah, he can regenerate. I, I don't know how, but I somehow forgot that Godzilla can regenerate. So in that moment, I was in shock, like, oh no, like I actually gasped in the theater, and I wasn't the only one. I think because I went opening night that Wednesday early showing on IMAX, and it was incredible, and it was a full house, and I wasn't the only one kind of like that forgot that Godzilla can heal himself, so there's a lot of the lore that they put in, but it kind of, you kind of forget about it because you're so engrossed in the dude's story, uh, Koichi's story, so yeah, it was just, what a ride, you know what I mean, it's, it's an emotional ride, you know what I mean, and I love the fact that uh, they treated him like, like I mentioned, Jaws, like the shark from Jaws, and uh, I would say the beginning, I did not expect at all, like this attack coming from like Spoilers, by the way, um, before he actually gets radiated, he's like a normal dinosaur that's just been living on an island that's been, you know, he's just been a dinosaur, right? And that's, you know, that's fine for a kaiju movie in terms of an origin story, but the fact that he they go all Jurassic Park with it at the beginning, and it's not like the happy-go-lucky Jurassic Park, it's like the 93 Jurassic Park that gets really kind of dark in the, in the second act and scares a bunch of kids. Like, if the kid was watching this movie at the beginning, I think he would be kind of, they would be kind of scared. Because the beginning of the movie is really like, you're seeing all these dudes die. You know what I mean? It's almost like a mass murder by this dinosaur. 
And uh, part of that PTSD is that Koichi has a chance to shoot him with his with his plane, but I still don't think that would have killed him. So there's this guilt there that he could have saved his fr- or they could have saved the people on that island that day. That's where a lot of his PTSD comes from. But uh, I still don't think he could have killed <laughs> Godzilla at that moment before he was even a giant. Because, uh, I don't know, something about that Godzilla is really scary. This is the scariest Godzilla I've ever seen, to be honest. And uh, it seems like he likes killing people, which is, yeah, that's a, that's a first for me. I don't think I've ever seen that. Uh, I think the closest thing we got was like a 2001 Godzilla movie where he came back. Uh, Godzilla comes back, but he's possessed by the dead souls of the the war victims of World War II kind of thing. So it, it kind of it's similar to that, but in this case, like... He's just like no emotion. He's kind of like a raw animal. You know what I mean? Just like an animal out who got irradiated and wanted to start killing people. So I like that. You know, he doesn't always have to be the hero. So that's really cool. And I really appreciated the whole like, like new hope of it all. Or in terms of like, you know, Luke wanted to become a pilot. And, uh, you know, there's a big, there's a big new hope moment at the end of this movie that uh, I really just, you know, lost my mind for. I almost wish. I almost wish that he said the the line from Jaws where he goes, suck on this, you son of a bitch, or whatever it is, take this, you son of a bitch. I was waiting for that line or something, but they didn't do that. But, uh, man, the, all the homages played off well in this movie, and uh, by the end, I was kind of standing on my feet just clapping. I mean, you mentioned the new hope of it all. It, it reminded me more of Dark Knight Rises with him ejecting from the plane, and even I think the visual is meant to echo some of that. So I would compare the ending of this movie more so to Dark Knight Rises. I get you, but uh, I think the sound design was great as well because I don't know if you noticed too. The moment he goes into Godzilla's mouth, spoiler alert, the music stops and it just feels like time stops for like two seconds to absorb that moment, and then it yes. slows up. It was fantastic. Um, so yeah, just the the visual of him disintegrating and the people on the boats like just cheering and just like saluting him. I thought that was like a great moment too. Uh, saluting your hand to me, so to speak, but man, it's like, I love the, that the people were coming together at the end to defeat Godzilla. It wasn't just like, hey, we're going to build this weapon kind of thing. We're going to out-science him, and I know you love the whole, we're going to use science to, to win the day gimmick, and they totally did that here, and I'm kind of curious as to your thoughts as how they killed him this time, because I have never even thought of that way to kill Godzilla before. They just I mean, did they really the kill ocean? him now? You don't okay, really they didn't really kill, kill him, but they defeated the evil Godzilla, I would say. You 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 postpone whatever he's going to do next. I think that's kind of what they did. I think it worked out really well. I mean, I think that the, the only way to really defeat Godzilla is through science. You're not going to blow him up. You're not going to be able to do anything in terms of just brute military force. I think that's the whole point, right? Like, the idea is, is that... You know, Japan tried kamikaze pilots and they tried to military their way out of something and it never worked. And I think the idea here is that science is what is going to win the day. And I like the idea that science ultimately is the reason why they are able uh, to defeat the threat for now. Of course, there will be another Godzilla movie kind of made by made by uh, by Toho, I'm sure. So it's not like Godzilla's going away, and they don't even... I mean, they're very clear. You, you see the eggs hatching at the end. So even they're very clear about the idea that, okay, Godzilla's not going away forever. And I appreciate that. But obviously, we are going to get another Godzilla movie uh, made by Legendary Pictures and Warner Brothers. Uh, that will be coming out later on this year with Godzilla and Kong together. And I think the, the moment that everybody seems really excited about is Godzilla and Kong literally running together. I don't know if that gets your uh, gets your gets you going. What do you think? Oh, dude, that's that's Rocky three right there, man. That's that's Apollo and Rocky running on the beach together, dog. That's what that's... if what what if Godzilla shouts, "There is no tomorrow" at King Kong. He might shout it out, and we'll have to translate it, and I'll be for it. Because because <laughs> listen, okay, Godzilla Kong is not going to be a Godzilla minus one, right? It's going to be a blockbuster, mindless action movie. But sometimes, you know, those can work too. Like it's, not, it's, you know, if you're going in you're thinking like this is not going to be a serious movie, I'm here to have fun. You'll probably have fun with it because considering that's a giant monster, right? Um, but in this case, they're kind of exploring the Hollow Earth, which is what I wanted more so in the last movie. They kind of, you know, they kind of showed you a little bit of it, but I think there's way more going on in the Hollow Earth, and I'm waiting for that. And I'm, they're finally doing it now, 
And because uh, if you think about it, they only went into a certain part of the Hollow Earth. Hollow Earth is the whole Earth, right? So there can be giant monsters all over the place that they, just, they don't know about, which is what I want to see. So, and you kind of got that in Monarch a little bit, but it turned out that was actually a different re realm and reality altogether. But uh, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, yeah, Kong Godzilla, I'm looking forward to it. There seems to be a giant orangutan with a balding head, which seems to be, you know, very appropriate, I think, considering that, uh, you know, how middle-aged dudes get. So I think that's going to be uh, a commentary there. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it. And Pink Godzilla is going to be dope. And I'm um, hearing all these different things about Mothra coming back, so I'm excited for that. So I'm a big Mothra fan, not going to lie. Love Mothra. Love the representation of her being, you know, the the guardian of Mother Earth kind of guardian. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, hopefully she does come because that's been the rumor. So. Uh, so now we can transition into talking about the uh, the Monarch television series uh, that's been airing on Apple for 10 weeks. And because it's an Apple production, they are certainly putting a lot of money forth. You know, it's not like this this TV show is loaded with Godzilla and Mothra and Kong, but you probably get more of them than that you might expect. Essentially, uh, you get a lot of character stuff for 50 minutes and then you get a little bit of uh, monster or Titan stuff for like two or three minutes. You get a couple good money shots in every episode. And I think you, you end up satisfying people in a lot of ways. And I think for me, one of the reasons that, you know, Brian requested to do something Godzilla based. And I agreed because the first, I would say four or five episodes of Monarch, I was super into you know, Godzilla minus one was definitely something that I wanted to talk about regardless, because I mean, in, uh, in my letterbox ranking of my movies of 2023, uh, Godzilla minus one is number 19 out of 120, uh, which I would say is pretty impressive, but, uh, the television show, I definitely was into it, uh, for the first few weeks, but I definitely was losing the thread a little bit as we were going on and losing some investment in the characters. I love the idea of Wyatt Russell and Kurt Russell playing the same person. I love the tease that Kurt Russell's character is supposed to be 90 years old, but he looks 70 years old, and kind of the running gag and how it actually pays off. And I, I think that they did some really smart things, but it really feels like... So I, I mentioned Shin Godzilla earlier in the bureaucracy, and it just feels like in a lot of ways we are kind of going back to the idea of bureaucracy, but they're not aware of how ironic it is that they're doing it. Kind of. So what happens is that Monarch in 2015, I don't know, how do I say this? It's like their their actions, I mean, they're, what, they're, what they do in, in terms of action-wise is like prevent people knowing that these kaiju even exist. And uh, as opposed to like doing the right thing and trying to like prevent a G-Day to happening again, it's like, they're not really doing that. It seems like they're just kind of like waiting for things to happen. And some of these Monarch members are kind of just done with it. And that's kind of the idea. And that's why they're switching to Apex by the end of the series, which, you know, they bring in Apex. And I was kind of like, are they going to bring in Apex? And then halfway through the show, the this one character, Maya, that was working for this company turned into Apex. So I was like, okay, there's the Apex. There's the connection there. But uh, yeah, just they try to have these connections and Monarch just seems like, you know, they don't want to really do much in terms of like regulating these monsters. They just want to kind of like plug the holes and not actually fix the the problems kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, but you know, Apex seems to be head on, which they're going to lead to creating a mega Godzilla in about three years in the timeline anyway. But um, yeah, I just thought the whole sci-fi storytelling aspect is what drew me into the show. Like you mentioned, like they're going from 1955 to 1959 and they're all these, you know, flashbacks to the origins of Monarch and stuff, which is great because that kind of reminds you of like a classic Kaiju Godzilla movie from back in the day. Cause it's got that feel to it because it is in the fifties. Um, but then once they do kind of the modern stuff, you know, some of those storylines were good, but then some of them kind of like faltered out. Like, I'm not sure if that Maya character was really necessary, but it's, is it, it, they created this love triangle between the brother and the sister and her, which is very cold blooded in my opinion, but you know, some, basically the sister's take it like the her brother's ex from her or from him and it's kind of like working and I would be surprised but it, it's a little cold-blooded in my opinion I don't, I don't think I would do that to a sibling and try to hook up with their ex but I mean they just met like a couple days beforehand so I, I get it 
spoiler alert, but yeah, that love triangle is really interesting. But uh, I was more interested in like the sci-fi stuff, especially like their grandmother falling in the hole. And you talked about, uh, you know, Godzilla minus one when she got blown away and she's like, oh, I bet she's not dead. You know, when I first see her falling like 50 feet, it's like, oh, she's dead. But then they keep alluding to the fact that she disappeared, that she disappeared. And they never say the word that deceased and died. I was like, huh. And then they fall in the hole. And I was like, huh. And then the big reveal. And you texted me this and you were kind of shocked that they went this direction. And that the grandma is still alive and it's only been 59 days down there. And it's so heartbreaking when they kind of reunite in uh, the last episode in the finale. But uh, it's one of those like crazy sci-fi storytelling elements that you can get away with because of the fact of like the time dilation, right? Interstellar does the same thing. But uh, I've seen some Doctor Who that do the same thing about time dilation in terms of gravity. So the fact that they went that direction made it even more heartbreaking because she realizes now that one day down there is like a year in real life. So it's it's heartbreaking when you kind of see her realize that, oh, my God, like I've been here for like 59 years or whatever. And, uh, you know, just the fact that she missed out on like her husband's life, her kid's life, her grandkids' lives. But then, you know, all of a sudden the grandkids like, you know, I need you to be my grand. She didn't exactly say I need you to be my grandmother. Please come with me. It's like is this history of like. You know, family tragedy, you know, so to speak, like a sort of Von Eric curse in terms of the family, which I kind of picked up on. And the idea of we want to break this curse and let's get you out of here. And let's even though, you know, you your time <laughs> displaced, you can still live a full life. And that, I thought that was a beautiful message at the end. But then we saw Kurt Russell die. Spoiler alert. And I just, oh, man, I was screaming at my TV, screaming at my TV. No, he is not. I don't know that he's dead, though. I think that's that's the trick is that I think he's just. I think he's still there. I think that's going to be the big reveal of the I second so, season. Too, but then I realized, like, he fell. He probably fell like a hundred feet. He probably fell like a hundred feet, right? Like Brian, uh, what is there's a rule in television and in movies that you always have to follow. Unless you see the body, they are not dead. I get you, and that's kind of the whole thing I was alluding to. I, I, about the I, grandma I, I am going. I'm going to spoil the ending of No Time to Die, just as a warning. Think about how far they went to prove that James Bond was dead. They literally had him blow up just to prove that he that version of the character was dead. Kurt Russell, I, I don't know. I, I am going to guess, though, that he is alive. He's not, no, he doesn't have a lot of time left. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Because if he's down there for, what, three days, that's three years? I don't know, man. It's, it's crazy. But uh, I was screaming at my TV because it's like, uh, I, I know we probably have mixed feelings on Tron Legacy. I'm, I'm assuming, but the whole I idea... have never seen Tron Legacy. Oh, okay. It's got the similar vibes because it's like, you know, father, son reuniting. But, you know, that takes place in the video game world. But it's very similar uh, kind of vibes. But that's kind of what I was feeling. And then, spoiler alert, I'm ruining Tron Legacy all these years later. Uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Lebowski. <laughs> Jeff Bridges never gets out. He never gets out. His son gets out. They were able to reunite in the video game world, but he never gets out. So it's kind of like, oh, he went back in. And I was thinking, like, is Kurt Russell getting out of this? Is he coming back out? And then I saw him get out of the fucking machine or the the whatever. And I was like, oh, no, he's he's staying. He's not coming back in. And I it just happened. And I was just like, no, I didn't want it to happen because I love Kurt Russell. You love Kurt Russell. But I guess that's that's a good payoff. But it did slow down in the previous, like, three episodes. And uh, I get why they did it. They had to stretch it out a little bit. Fill in some character stuff here and there, but uh, I think really what it boils down to is the sci-fi storytelling that um, I'm sure a lot of people were like love Lost for that kind of thing, and I wasn't really into Lost, but in this case, this kind of storytelling really drew me in, and the fact that she was still alive, the grandma, uh, got me emotional, I'm not going to lie, because I did not expect what was going to happen, like I did not even expect her like to be alive, and then once revealed it, and then the whole time dilation thing is just like heartbreaking, because you realize, oh, she missed like everything. But it's not over yet. You know, she still has a second chance. And I think that was the whole message of it all. Yeah, I'm not sure how invested I would be in a in a season two of this. But that's clearly the direction that they're going in. And I, I think that there is this uh, there is this desire to have both movies and television shows to kind of keep these franchises going. I mean, we see it with Marvel. We see it with Star Wars. And we're even seeing it with the uh, the Monsters universe. And I think that there has been a mixed level of success but i think that the monster universe the reason that they're able to uh find so much so much level of success 
is people love big, they love Godzilla, they love Kong. I don't think there is as want of a desire to know the whole lore. So I think people can much easier, uh, in a much better way, pick and kind of choose what they want to watch. I mean, I don't think you're going to need to see this show to appreciate the next movie. I don't necessarily know that you need to see the movie to even have watched the show. I think they do a good job of explaining everything that they need to. Uh, I, I just am not sure like what's going to happen in the future uh, as the show evolves. I mean, how much more can they really go with this? But I, I do want to say that uh, there are a number of cast members uh, from Godzilla who are also on another Apple show uh, called Pachinko, uh, including the lead of this of the show, Anasua or Anasawai. Uh, Anasawai is having a big year already here in 2024, and she is not only a part of the Godzilla TV series, but is also going to be a big part uh, of an FX show uh, that is going to be forthcoming. So that is also. Uh, a big deal. Uh, the name of the show is uh, Shogun. I've been seeing commercials all over the place for it and watching the fifth season of Fargo. Uh, so we'll see how that show turns out. But uh, another reason, Brian, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tease your interest in this is uh, Hiroyuki Sanada is in Shogun. So I think that'll that'll pique your interest. I saw the trailer when I was with my family on Christmas, and I was like, oh, I think this is a remake of the '70s show because there is a '70s show or a miniseries back in the day called Shogun. I'm pretty sure it's probably just a remake, knowing these uh, network TVs and how they work, but I'm really excited for it. I'm actually looking forward to it, because kind of grew a celebrity crush on Anasawa during this whole Monarch run. Like, I've never seen her before. She comes in, she's got she's bilingual, and she pulls up both languages. Okay, I guess she does Japanese okay, you know. But still, like, being, a, being, a, being able to be a bilingual actor like this, and it's like, okay... You know, and she's got a good look and like I think she can take, you know, I think she'd be a star somewhere down the line. Uh, we'll see. But a, a lot of the, my friends who watch the show as well, they were very uh, on board <laughs> being her fans. Uh, I think we all kind of got crushes on her, but I think that's kind of like how the way Hollywood is designed. So they all want you to get this crush on her. That way you can kind of like watch her and other things. Same thing with, with a Brad Pitt or something like that. It might work for her. I don't know. But uh you know, if there is a season two, like, I wouldn't be surprised if they bring John Goodman back and he turns out he's alive, because, again, you mentioned that we never saw a body, so they may be saving that for season two. Um, but also, I kind of want to see the, the focus of the show change. I want Keiko, uh, the grandma, Mari Yamamoto, I think she should be the lead of the show for season two, because I feel like after the end of that episode, it's season, in, in episode 10, I was fully invested and ready for a show built around her. And her, like, coming back to the real world and all that kind of thing. I, f- I find that all fascinating because that's essentially what we got at the beginning of, like, Captain America 2. Of him coming back to the real world and adapting. And I love that kind of sci-fi shit. Where it's, like, a commentary on our common culture. And then comparing it to the previous culture. And then there's this dialogue that Kurt Russell and her have in, while they're in that world in episode 10. Talking about, like, how things have changed. But things are really the same. That's like, you know, we have phones now in our hands or whatever. And TVs are flat and they're everywhere. But, you know, there's still moms, there's still dads, there's still brothers, there's still sisters. And I love that little dialogue he had right there, like, just saying, like, despite, you know, you being gone for so long, things are still kind of the same when it comes to, like, family and stuff like that. So I thought that was a really, like, beautiful moment. I thought Kurt Russell did a great job with that dialogue sequence right there. Um, Yeah, overall, I think Kurt Russell did a great job in this, considering that, you know, he's transitioning to the TV. Uh, Has he done any shows before this? I don't think so, right? So... Um, I'm sure he did some TV in the 70s I'm sure that as part of when he was a Disney kid That he did some television shows But in terms of It's uh, it's definitely been a while Since he's been a major part uh, Of a TV show Beyond probably a guest starring role uh, So this, uh, I, you know, this is a big deal And obviously Wyatt Russell Who we've seen in Falcon and the Winter Soldier uh, He has also uh, been in other TV shows as well So Wyatt Russell is a little bit more established in TV. I'm not sure how much we're going to get of him in future seasons. I don't know. To me, it feels like there was a lot of potential in the 1950 storyline, and it didn't really go anywhere. So I think that's part of the issue for me, is that it just felt like that was the thread that they were going to pull on pretty hard, and then it just kind of petered out. And it's really unfortunate, because uh, I think that their part of the story was... I was I was very much invested in what they were doing. I, I will say that. 
Uh, I will say that it was kind of cool to like, they didn't have to do this, but the, the creators of the show kind of went out of their way to show and explain how Godzilla's changed physically over time. Because a lot of fans have noticed online, like every time there's a new movie, he changes physically. And they think it's like the director's just making these changes that it doesn't follow the continuity or whatever. But in this case, they kind of show that like, uh, I guess whenever he hits like a big source of radiation, he evolves or changes. Because they actually show you like in the earlier episodes, like that, this incredible sequence of them at... Uh, Bikini Atoll, which they actually kind of referenced in Minus One, but uh, they show it, and it's, it's that uh, stock footage you see in the beginning of Godzilla 2014, and they actually show you the footage this time, and you see Godzilla like about to bite into this tower thing that's got a, like a, a nuke on it, and they just blow the nuke up, and they assume they killed Godzilla, and they find out that no, he just grew bigger, and he got bulkier, and he survived. So <laughs> I was like, okay, they're, they're explaining things now. Like how he looks compared movie to movie is because of these like drastic intakes of like radiation, which I'm assuming is going to happen in Kong, Godzilla, Legacy, whatever, because there's that scene of Godzilla in the ice and it looks like he's glowing pink. And then all of a sudden you see him having pink fins or, you know what I mean? So it's like, okay, they're doing the whole evolution thing again. So they're always evolving the character of Godzilla in terms of his look, which I think is good because he keeps it fresh for every movie. So I'm kind of looking forward to that aspect. Cause in this case we saw like two or three different versions of Godzilla in the show. It was very subtle, but you can tell like the physical changes that throughout the years that this guy's gone through from like all these different hits of radiation. So this is that, I thought that was a little cool thing as well. And I don't know. I don't know if you noticed this too, Jerome, did you notice the dragon uh, that they found in the fifties? It's the same dragon that they fight at the end, but did you notice how much it grew considering that the time period that grew like, five times the size, which was like kind of mind blowing. If you think about it. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you on that. I think it is pretty, cre- pretty incredible, pretty wild uh, that that's that they would go in that direction. I just, I think from a visual standpoint, I think the show looks very good. Mostly. I think all Apple shows generally have a pretty, dis- pretty decent look to them. It's just, I think the issue is, did this really have to be 10 episodes? Kind of the focus is a little bit all over the place. I will definitely uh, give season two a try. Uh, we'll see where it goes, but this is this is not a franchise. I don't have to consume everything in order to appreciate it. Like I, w- I'm very interested in seeing you know the movies for kind of them as a spectacle, with the understanding that maybe I'm not going to get everything I want. But I mean, the movies are always cast really well, so so there's there's that aspect of it, but. Uh, that is pretty much it for this week in terms of uh, what I have to say about uh, two recent Godzilla projects. And it's pretty incredible that after 70 years of Godzilla, we have different versions of the character uh, that are really having an impact on the culture. And it seems like uh, right now, especially like there seems to be a lack of big movies coming out of the field. So it feels like Kong Godzilla coming out in like March is like the next big one. And that's kind of the feeling right now. Right. I don't know if you feel it too, but that seems like the, like the big movie coming out. Cause there's no like other big Marvel movie coming out in the next six months. I don't think. So this kind of seems like it's kind of like getting the, you know, a lot of the attention, which it should be. And, uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I know that, uh, like, I don't know if it's going to make the money that people are going to think it's going to make, but, uh, I will say this for a pandemic movie that Kong King Kong vs Godzilla was, it actually did really well for a pandemic you know, movie. I think it got a hundred domestic, which no one was expecting. I gotta confirm that, but it was around there, and people were thinking way less because it was the same day as HBO Max dropping. But that's not happening anymore, obviously. So I'm kind of curious to see what's going on with the box office because I I did notice too that like when uh, they dropped that movie King Kong vs Godzilla same day on the app, I started noticing the other movies were trending as well again. So I don't know if this is leading to a big like renewal renewed interest in the character, and we're gonna get this big turnout. Well, we'll see. I don't know. It feels like there's this big comeback of Godzilla coming right now, and it kind of feels like this next movie coming out is going to be a culmination of that in terms of, like, a box office success. Yeah, I think the fact that there are not a lot of big movies coming out in 2024 because of the strike and uh, because of any number of other issues, I think this movie has the potential uh, to do pretty well, especially if it's marketed well and especially if it gets good reviews. So uh, we'll see. I think that the reviews do matter, Uh, but we will see. Uh, Brian, next week, uh, you, uh, you get, you get it off because Ben Phillips and I are going to be discussing our top 10 movies of 2023. I teased, uh, my letterbox a little bit earlier, but Ben and I are very excited 
uh, to go over a, a fantastic year in movies and some of our uh, favorites. I will tell you, our lists are very different. Uh, so you will have to. Li- so, Brian, you will have that to look forward to as listening, I'm sure. For sure, because I will be uploading it to all the various platforms and uh, doing the YouTube stuff for it. So I'll be I'll be listening for sure. But uh, I did not want nearly watch as many movies as you guys this year. But I will say that. Just off the top of my head, the movies that really stood up for me this year were obviously Godzilla Minus One, uh, Guardians 3, and probably Air. I, I've seen Air like three or four times already. Uh, I know that sounds crazy, but somehow that really just inspires me creatively, and I just feel like this creative connection to the film in terms of like what they were going for and the lessons learned in that movie in terms of like less is more, don't have a lot of stock on an item that way, the value goes up more, that kind of thing. It, it really taught me a lot about business and stuff that I was already implementing myself in my little side hustle when it comes to trading cards. But yeah, Air really just kind of like brought it to the, to the spotlight in terms of like, wow, I've been doing kind of this whole side hustle thing the same way you know, this whole time. So that was really cool. But uh, my overall ratings, I would say Monarch, the show, seven and a half out of 10, maybe an eight out of 10. There was that lull uh, in the, towards the, the second half. Godzilla minus one, nine out of 10 for sure. Uh, yeah, I would say eight out of 10 uh, for Godzilla minus one. Definitely really good. I'm um, at about a six and a half or seven out of 10 uh, for Monarch. So not as high as you on that, but Godzilla minus one, definitely a high, high recommendation. Uh, in two weeks, Brian, very excited. Uh, we are going to be doing something special since uh, February has become the month for the Super Bowl. Uh, we are going to be doing football related movies and uh, we have a very uh, excited list uh, I will tell everyone next week what not only what movie we will be reviewing, but we will be going back to our theme of the first Tuesday of every month. We will be not only reviewing a movie, but associating a wrestling match with it. And I will tease that all next week. So for Brian, my name is Carol. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I will talk to you again next week. We as a duo will talk to you again in two weeks.